brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that supports life and family. 5% of your monthly plan price goes to your favorite charity. Mention offer code TRADITION for a special Christmas offer. Learn more at CharityMobile.com. Are we, as Catholics, like the Pharisees, who pay God nothing but lip service? We say nice-sounding things in prayer when others are watching, but in private, our prayer lives are either inadequate, sloppy, or non-existent. Do we merely live a Catholic life by rote? Giving little thought to eternal things, to the respect due to God. Are our hearts united to God? Or are we walking about going through the motions? This is the next part in Pope Pius XII's encyclical on the liturgy and do Catholic worship in the Sacred Heart. It may touch a few people in a convicting way. And that's why I chose this one to be so short today. I usually will let these reflections from popes, these small samples of papal encyclicals, run a little longer than this one. But this is such a key point that it bears focusing on. Are we living the life in reality we profess with our lips? I don't mean these to make people feel bad and make, th make people think the faith is impossible to live. But we should think seriously about this. The life of faith we live is the most important thing we do in our lives, full stop. Let me know what you think of this at the end. Liturgical practice begins with the very founding of the church. The first Christians, in fact, quote, were persevering in the doctrine of the apostles and in the communication of the breaking of bread and in prayers. Whenever their pastors can summon a little group of the faithful together, they set up an altar on which they proceed to offer the sacrifice and around which are arranged all the other rites appropriate for the saving of souls and for the honor due to God. Among these latter rites, the first place is reserved for the sacraments, namely the seven principal fonts of salvation. There follows the celebration of the divine praises, in which the faithful also join, obeying the behest of the Apostle Paul, in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual canticles, singing in grace in your hearts to God. Next comes the reading of the law, the prophets, the gospel, and the apostolic epistles, and last of all, the homily or sermon in which the official head of the congregation recalls and explains the practical bearing of the commandments of the divine master and the chief events of his life, combining instruction with appropriate exhortation and illustration of the benefit of all his listeners. As circumstances and the needs of Christians warrant, public worship is organized, developed and enriched by new rites, ceremonies, and regulations, always with a single end in view, that we must use these external signs to keep us alert, learn from them what distance we have come along the road, and by them be heartened to go on further with more eager step. For the effect will be more precious the warmer the affection which precedes it. Here then is a better and more suitable way to raise the heart to God. Thenceforth the priesthood of Jesus Christ is a living and continuous reality, through all the ages to the end of time. Since the liturgy is nothing more nor less than the exercise of this priestly function, like her divine head, the church is forever present in the midst of her children. She aids and exhorts them to holiness, so that they may one day return to the Father in heaven, clothed in that beatuous raiment of the supernatural. To all who are born to life on earth, she gives a second, supernatural kind of birth. She ar arms them with the Holy Spirit up for the struggle against the implacable enemy. She gathers all Christians about her altars, inviting and urging them repeatedly to take part in the celebration of the Mass, feeding them with the bread of angels, to make them ever stronger. She purifies and consoles the hearts that sin has wounded and soiled. Solemnly, she consecrates those whom God has called to the priestly ministry. She fortifies with new gifts of grace the chaste nuptials of those who are destined to found and bring up a Christian family. When, as last, she has soothed and refreshed the closing hours of this earthly life by holy viaticum and extreme unction, with the utmost affection, she accompanies the mortal remains of her children to the grave, lays them reverently to rest, and confides them to the protection of the cross, against the day when they will triumph over death and rise again. She has a further solemn blessing and an invocation for those of her children, who dedicate themselves to the service of God in the life of religious perfection. 
Finally, she extends to the souls in purgatory, who implore her intercession and her prayers, the helping hand which may lead them happily at last to the eternal blessedness in heaven. The worship rendered by the church to God must be in its entirety, interior as well as exterior. It is exterior because the nature of man as a composite of body and soul requires it to be so. Likewise, because divine providence has disposed that, that while we recognize God visibly, we may be drawn by him to love of things unseen. Every impulse of the human heart, besides expresses itself naturally through the senses, and the worship of God, being the concern not merely of individuals, but of the whole community of mankind, must therefore be social as well. This obviously it cannot be, unless religious activity is also organized and manifested outwardly. Exterior worship finally reveals and emphasizes the unity of the mystical body, feeds new fuel to its holy zeal, fortifies its energy, intensifies its action day by day. For although the ceremonies themselves can claim no perfection or sanctity in their own right, they are nevertheless the outward acts of religion, designed to rouse the heart, like signals of a sort, to veneration of the sacred realities, and to raise the mind to meditation on the supernatural. They serve to foster piety, to kindle the flame of charity, to increase our faith and deepen our devotion. They provide instruction for simple folk, decoration for divine worship, continuity of religious practice. They make it possible to tell genuine Christians from their false or heretical counterparts. But the chief element of divine worship must be interior, for we must also live in Christ and give ourselves to him completely, so that in him, with him, and through him the Heavenly Father may be duly glorified. The sacred liturgy requires, however, that both of these elements be intimately linked with each other. This recommendation the liturgy itself is careful to repeat, as often as it prescribes an exterior act of worship. Thus we are urged, when there is question of fasting, for example, to give interior effect to our outward observance. Otherwise, religion clearly amounts to mere formalism, without meaning and without content. You recall, venerable brethren, how the divine master expels from the sacred temple, as unworthily to worship there, people who pretend to honor God with nothing but neat and well-turned phrases, like actors in a theater, and think themselves perfectly capable of working out their eternal salvation without plucking their inveterate vices from their hearts. It is therefore the keen desire of the church that all the faithful kneel at the feet of the Redeemer to tell him how much they venerate and love him. She wants them present in crowds, like the children whose joyous cries accompanied his entry into Jerusalem, to sing their hymns and chant their song of praise and thanksgiving to him who is king of kings and source of every blessing. She would have them move their lips in prayer, sometimes in petition, sometimes in joy and gratitude, and in this way experience his merciful aid and power like the apostles of the lakeside of Tiberias, or abandon themselves totally, like Peter on Mount Tabor, to mystic union with the eternal God in contemplation. It is an error, consequently, and a mistake to think of the sacred liturgy as merely the outward or visible part of divine worship, or as an ornamental ceremonial. No less erroneous is the notion that it consists solely in a list of laws and prescriptions according to which the ecclesiastical hierarchy orders the sacred rites to be performed. It should be clear to all, then, that God cannot be honored worthily unless the mind and heart turn to him in quest of the perfect life, and that the worship rendered to God by the church in union with her divine head is the most efficacious means of achieving sanctity. Pope Pius XII often gets a bad rap. He presided over one of the worst eras in the history of the church. Not internally, although there were plenty of internal problems at that time, but from external threats. And so he wasn't able necessarily to devote himself as fully to the crisis of modernism in the church. That This compounded with the fact that he gave Archbishop Annibale Bugnini his job of twisting the liturgy. He was the first to reform the liturgy under Pope Pius XII's time, well before Vatican II, which then opened the door to the changes at the Second Vatican Council, especially those touching on the liturgy. And it became obvious that towards the end of Pius XII's life, he was either being manipulated by modernists around him in the Roman Curia, or he was becoming sympathetic to them. You won't find that in this encyclical, though. I am curious what you have to say about this encyclical so far. Are you surprised at all that Mediator Dei has this clear focus on the liturgy and why the liturgy matters in our life as Catholics? Let me know what you think of this in the comments. Let me know if you'd like to hear this kind of thing coming from current crowd running Rome.
as opposed to all the synodal nonsense we hear constantly now. And uh, hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So does sharing this on social media. That helps too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.